Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our session, What the Flock is Google's proposed solution, a fair one for the wider industry. So this session, as the title suggests, is going to be pretty much all about federated learning of cohorts. Um, I think within the audience we'll have different levels of understanding of what that is. Some of you, um, it will be something you've read about a few times in the trade pubs. For others of you, it's pretty much uh, all consuming right now. But as a brief sort of intro to it, um, when Google said they were going to end support for third party cookies on Chrome, they suggested that we'd probably see alternatives. Well, no, they said that we, we would see alternatives emerge from within the privacy sandbox. Um, and federated learning of cohorts is one specifically which looks to replace the ability to target ads at people based on their general interests. Um, so, kind of the, the high level idea behind that is that instead of like tracking individual users, the browser looks at the sorts of sites they're visiting, groups them together with other um, similar interest people um, into a cohort, and then those cohorts are what advertisers can use to, to target their ads. Um, now, obviously, they're, they're, that's quite technical stuff. The, the conversation goes a lot beyond that. Um, the implications for the industry are quite big, and a lot of people say that really what this works out doing is playing into Google's hands um, because of uh, you know, what they can do outside of Block with their first party data. So all of that's going to come into this conversation. Um, but first, we're going to look uh, a bit at the sort of how it's going to how it's going to play out for, for marketers and for publishers. Um, so joining me for this conversation, um, we've got three great panelists to let them introduce themselves. And we'll start with you, please, Miles. Hey, Miles Younger, uh, Senior Director, go to market uh, with uh, Mighty Hive slash S4 Capital's uh, data practice. Uh, been with Mighty Hive about three and a half years, and prior to that, uh, founded and ran a dynamic creative platform. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Anna? Hey, everyone. I'm Anna Milicevic. I'm the co-founder and principal of Sparrow Advisors. We're a management consultancy that focuses on ad tech, martech, commerce, and adjacent industries. And we help up every, uh, every constituent in the ecosystem figure out how to work better with each other. Fantastic. Thank you. And Richard? I'm Richard Kramer. I'm the founder of Arate Research. We're uh, over 20 years now providing independent investment research for, uh, for a bunch of global investors, uh, about 300 of them. And uh, we have done a tremendous amount of detailed work in the ad tech world, which has been of great interest to the investment community in the past six and seven years. Brilliant. Thanks all. Um, so to start with, I want to look kind of almost separating although it's hard to do so, separating what from the fact that it's uh, a Google-led proposal and just looking at the idea behind it that um, we're now targeting cohorts of users um, based on their interests rather than individuals. Um, do you all think that that is a good and workable replacement uh, for how third-party cookies have been used for, for behavioral targeting previously? Um, I certainly think it's viable. Uh, you know, I think you can probably achieve pretty similar performance uh, to what you would get at a user level, uh, if not identical, possibly even superior. Uh, and it certainly solves for um, questions of preserving user anonymity. So, I mean, I, I'm bullish on it in that it seems to satisfy a lot of requirements simultaneously, and, and it seems like it should be performant for, for advertisers. I, I too see it as a kind of a transitional measure to go from this one to one to one to many. Uh, but I, I think the, the devil will be in the details and it's very easy to map out some scenarios in which shifting to Flux is actually worse for user experience. So, you know, rather than that one shoe that you looked at following you, now somebody else's shoe is following you around the internet. And I think a lot of thought will need to go into the algorithms for qualification, which is not a new challenge. I mean, we, we face this challenge daily with just rudimentary segment definition and campaign definitions. So I'm, I'm kind of cautiously optimistic, but definitely see it as a, as a, a measure that is just kind of a stopgap between the current advertising world and the world will have five to 10 years from now. Yeah. And I think I, what I would add to that are two things. First of all, I think what we're seeing is a giant wedge being driven between privacy law and competition law. And in this case, we're looking at privacy law being elevated as a sacrosanct relative to competition law, which in this case is, is one company assembling 
what we used to call segments, I think as Anna right, rightly pointed out, and now we're going to call cohorts. And there used to be a lively market. The second point I'd say is there used to be a lively market in, in segments, um, or there still is. But that was a bit of a sausage factory because we knew that a lot of what was going into those segments was of very poor quality or, or dubious quality. And no one ever was able to unpack the, the success of match rates of 30% times 30% times 30%, which would get you to the unique shoe following on or around the internet. Um, but, but now we're going to be replacing that with one version of the truth, one set of segments. So that's a big change for people, but it's being driven by this primacy of privacy law over competition law. Mm, yeah, I mean, looking at like the, the, how big an impact Flock specifically will have, um, I guess one question is how, how big a part will Flock play in, in markets' targeting strategies? Because it is one piece of the puzzle. Obviously the reason we're talking about it so much is because Google have essentially said that this is where they're placing their bets for that kind of interest-based targeting. And then with their announcement last week that they won't, um, they won't support alternate identifiers that kind of suggests even more that, that Flock is gonna be the way things are going. But there are other you know, ways to target users. Um, so do you think Flock is gonna be sort of a big part of marketers targeting strategies post, post cookies not being supported anymore? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, to, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, to, to the extent that this has already been baked into uh, media mix modeling and plans, I mean, I think that's something that uh, definitely those advertisers that are heavily focused on Google properties will take into consideration. But what, what's going to be uh, challenging here is really understanding if marketers have a preference or a, a point of view as a kind of <laughs> as a cohort <laughs> on cohorts. And from conversations we've had with marketers um, recently, the, the larger marketers are approaching privacy usually from a different perspective, typically from some type of consideration for a data clean room. They are looking at it from uh, the perspective of their CDP or a different technology stack, so not just on the activation layer. So I, I don't think it's as top of mind for marketers as it may seem to folks who are focused on uh, privacy. And to Richard's point, that's a that's a really really important distinction here. This is the the kind of the privacy side of the conversation versus the antitrust side of the conversation, and it really kind of depends on where you fall, <laughs> what what is more more relevant and more important to you as a marketer. So I I, I see it largely as neutral. I think the most interest so far has been from people who are more on the ad tech and pipes side of things who are tasked with making this whole elaborate expensive mess work mm -hmm. than it has from the people who are ultimately footing the bills for marketing campaigns. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a couple things that are gonna have to happen. Uh, and this is not an exhaustive list is Google and some advertisers are gonna have to prove that it works. Um, regardless of how they make it work, they're just gonna have to prove that the methodology is performant um, and then, you know, secondly, uh, in or, you know, I, I don't know that m marketers, it's going to take them a long time to understand what these cohorts are, how flock works. I mean, this is very similar, or it could be very similar to, you know, the education around like real time bidding that had to happen 10 plus years ago. I mean, that was a whole thing to get everybody up to speed and educated on that. Um, and so this will have to get baked into DSPs and buying tools in order, I think, for marketers to really kind of understand what it is, they're going to have to have some some buttons to push, basically. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I do want to start looking specifically at, at sort of Google's role in this. Um, I, I guess one of the complaints is that for all Google's talk about, you know, we don't, we see a future where we're not tracking individuals around the web um, and targeting them based on their activity. Within Google's properties, you'll still be able to see what users have been doing bring in your own data and, and target them um so there's you know skepticism that this is really just about um benefiting google's own business do you guys agree with that or do you see that google are in a legitimate bind here sort of as you were referencing earlier richard about um you know there's the, the, there's privacy legislation against antitrust legislation and they're just saying well we have to listen to privacy legislation um what do you guys make of that argument i mean i, I would i'll take a stab at that because i think there are some major questions which remain unanswered about what's going to unfold in the next year. 
and actually I would think of it unfolding with the deadline of the 1st of January, 2023, which is when the California Privacy Rights Act, it's not CCPA anymore, it's CPRA, comes into force. So we don't know yet whether Google will consider Chrome one of its O and O properties and sites, and mm -hmm. therefore it has access to all of that data. We don't know if it replaces the ad tech tax, whether there will be a fee for accessing cohorts the way one pays a fee for accessing segments today. Um, and if all of this data that is generated within these cohorts sits on device somehow, who has the access to the lookup tables of those that data set on device? So I think there are a lot of big questions that still need to be fleshed out. And some of those sit behind Google. Um, and we may never get the full answers to them in our, in our uh, outsider perspective. But some of them are going to have to be answered by all these other ad tech uh, supply chain participants who are going to either see their business dry up or need to find an alternative way around them. So I think we're still halfway through this two-year journey to Privacy Sandbox. And now we're sort of A-B testing some of, the, some of the parameters that we'll end up having to work with in a year's time. Well, is that it? I, I just wanted to follow on a couple of the, the remarks Richard made is that there are still a, a tremendous amount of questions as to functionally how this will work. You know, Richard's talking about fees and stuff. To me, we're several steps removed from figuring out how this might yeah. be monetized across all the, the various parties. So like it's, we could spend hours talking just about the number of questions that are still out there about this for sure. I think that that kind of sums up the point. It's we're, we're here where this is rolling out and there are so many questions that various ad tech constituents have about this, but Google can also choose not to answer any of them because uh, they don't have to. And you know, the 20% the or so of marketing spend that the open internet is, is capturing, it's less than that now, is, is uh, having less of a voice in, in these kinds of considerations. So I, I, I agree, it's gonna be an interesting two years, but I, I definitely see this as something that Google's kind of going to uh, do anyway. <laughs> so it's kind of the onus is on everybody else to figure out how to adjust and to understand how to still make money given this new set of, of uh, uh, guidelines or for lack of a better term. Yeah. For what it's worth, I, I don't know that Google has a great deal of like other viable alternatives. Like mm -hmm. th third party data is going away. Mm -hmm. Google didn't make that happen. They're certainly not standing in the way of it going away. They kind of have slow walked it a bit, but they're not standing in the way of it going away. And it's not happening because of them. And yet they sit in the center of an ecosystem that runs in large part on third party data. Mm -hmm. And so they've got to find some way to bridge those two worlds. Uh, right, going from also, kind of a third-party data-driven ecosystem to something where users are just a lot more anonymous. But but they also sit on a trove of first-party data. And so, mm -hmm. you know, part of this is a, a bridge between those two worlds. And, it, you know, Google can very easily shift to, okay, third-party goodbye, first-party only, and still be in a very, very advantageous position, which again, going back to, to Richard's uh, first point about you know, privacy versus versus uh, competition, I, I think sets up a really uh, unfavorable uh, world for uh, just non Google ad tech. And, and I'm sure it didn't escape the clearly well well informed notice of our panelists that when Apple decided to introduce app tracking transparency <laughs> and potentially deprecate IDFAs, they did happen to tick box their own personalized ads as a default. Mm. So <laughs> given that we were able to discover that in subsequent builds of iOS 14, um, we don't know yet what, uh, I'm sure Miles, you're, you're ready, you're eager to look into the technical details of what's behind Privacy Sandbox and Phlox and Turtle Dove and Fledge and all of these things, but we don't know yet what the tick boxes are on the screens that we haven't yet been able to see. Mm. I, I want to hear you guys thoughts on like how comfortable we think the industry will be with the level of trust, which we've already talked about a bit, the level of the trust required um, towards Google in terms of, you know, this system where 
the browser is creating these cohorts and you just receive these and say, okay, that's what this user is, we'll accept that. Um, Richard, you re reference, we don't really know whether that data will be shared with other parts of Google's business, but assuming they say that it's not, um, then you kind of just have to trust that fact. Um, and at the moment, you know, we're also trusting, I guess Google have said uh, that it's 95% effective as cookie-based targeting. And again, there's a level of trust there and, you know, okay, well, I guess it's ready to go then. Do you think the industry feels comfortable when Google is kind of asking for this kind of trust in placing that sort of trust in them? Anyone want to jump on? Uh, well, I'm happy to give you a very, a, a sort of very quick answer and hand it over. But um, right now you have the majority of digital ads been happening on what are, what you would call self-attributing networks. Hmm. And that, so, that, that's the point that, I, that I'd want to pick up on as well. And, you know, we've had so many measurement scandals just in the past 24 months between Facebook and Google. I mean, Facebook, you know, misstates their video numbers, their like uh, routinely basically. So I think the uh, issue of trust is a really, really loaded question here. What could help is if there were independent verification of the results, the, the very encouraging results that Google is, is uh, sharing initially, but then that's actually not that easy to construct operationally because who, who would be that kind of the, you know, the who watches the watchman type of layer here. Uh, so I, I don't know that they've necessarily deserved the trust, but we also don't have any other options but to trust not just Google, but every walled garden. Yeah, I mean, this just, I'll kind of almost repeat myself is, uh, you know, Google and marketers are gonna have to throw some media budgets behind this to see if it works. And that's gonna be the only way to know. Cause Google, I think the 95% number even is based on simulation. So I don't know the extent to which, you know, Google is even testing this in a, in a live environment at this point. So, Maybe uh, we, just, we just boot up synthetic audiences and just leave it at that. <laughs> and then, you know, 95% performance in a, percent performance in a synthetic audience is good enough. <laughs> Let's try it live. But I, I think something you would, you know, that you, both touched on, Google has an incentive to make this work mm -hmm. and not to defend the measurement scandals we've had in Facebook and Google, but the rest of the open web is uh, a, a hot mess of fraud, uh, um, uh, misrepresentation, uh, dubious uh, identifiers, cookie trading, cookie sync, and all of that. So um, the fact that you would potentially have measurement APIs to test is, a, is, is probably a benefit over a lot of other spend that's happening anyways. So I, you know, I, it's really now it's the incentive of Google to prove that these segments, that these blocks work uh, and, and deliver value and they'll probably be rewarded in the pricing of them. I mean, not, not to mention there's other aspects of privacy sandbox in play here, like the anti-fraud stuff, uh, there's kind of anti-fingerprinting. So there's a lot of stuff that they're doing to, it's not going to get rid of all sort of, you know, measurement errors, et cetera, et cetera, but it does seem like they're making a fairly good faith effort to get rid of a lot of the worst aspects of sort of programmatic audiences, user level tracking, digital tracking and targeting and measurement, et cetera. Yeah. And, and, and you would think that Apple likewise has an incentive, but maybe not the experience to eventually flesh out SK ad network and make that functional uh, for, for marketers and something that's well understood, uh, which they, they haven't yet done. It's still very early days. So you, these are things that need to be learned, like you say, together with, with the marketers and to see how it works. I wanna, I wanna look um, at obviously last week's big news as well, which we've referenced already, um, that Google won't support uh, alternative identifiers within its own, within its own products. Um, I mean, I'd be interested just generally, like how big of an impact do you think that announcement, you know, some people saying it's not really an announcement, we've known that that would be their stance this whole time, but you know, it's it's been received as news to the industry. Um, so how big an impact do you think that has and does that just kill off, do you think these, these alternative identifiers that the industry has been kind of working away at for quite a while? 
Yeah, I think it, the biggest impact it has is on antitrust regulators, and that that should be, you know, something that they're that, that that's kind of landing in their inbox is very hot. I, I think in in uh, what what I'm very concerned about there is just the mismatch of power <laughs> that a walled garden like Google has in these types of uh, conversations and considerations where they can just kind of unilaterally say, all right, this is happening and we picked a date and this is when it's going to happen without filling in those, those blanks and explaining more clearly about, you know, what are the options that are going to be available? How can marketers adjust and stuff? So it, it does seem like you know, stuff that we knew is happening is going to happen, but there's a force here that that I, I think from an antitrust perspective is counterintuitive to any positive intent that Google may have to, to solve this and or Apple may have to solve for SK ad network, etc. Mm -hmm. um, my perspective on <clears throat> that sort of, uh, you know, them disallowing these um, these alternative identifiers is, I mean, Google's got a lot of risk to mitigate there where they've got basically these de facto audience graphs sort of flowing through their systems, meaning they're taking kind of ownership of these audience graphs because stuff is hitting their log files, hitting their databases, they have the data. And increasingly regulators are saying like, look, we don't care if your intentions are good with this data or if, if, the, if your intentions are benign, you have the data, therefore you have the audience graph, therefore you are responsible for all of these people's private data. Mm -hmm. It seems like Google wants out of that business. They're fine with their own O and O data and they're fine with their own clients having their own first party data, but they don't want to facilitate these kind of de facto third party audience graphs. Um, and so it, it, that's, I, I think a lot of what's driving them doing this is they just don't want to be in that business anymore. And the other thing that I'll point out is that Google's in a little bit of a race now so that dollars don't flood out of the Google stack and into say a stack like the trade desk that's going to accept these alternative identifiers and kind of give a lot of marketers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what they want, which is sort of user level targeting. And so it's not as if Google doing this sort of unilaterally necessarily puts them in an advantageous position it could also go the other way do you think that do you think that might happen you think companies like the trade desk might win out just that the draw of these alternative identifiers will be too strong for marketers i i guess what i'm saying is i don't know like it could play out either way either google doing this could really put the kibosh on these uh sort of first party back-end sync audience graphs or the dollars sort of flood the exits and, and end up flooding into those graphs mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I would add a couple things to that. First of all, I mean, let's let's be clear. There are something like 37 identity solutions in the market right now and four or five being developed. So whoever thinks that that's a great way to safeguard your personal data and decide which of those 37 alternatives you'd like to uh, sign the donate, data donation agreement with, um, I, I don't think that's a viable solution either. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're right now uh, chastising Google for proposing that there should be an anonymous single identifier that we can all agree on. And you look at the alternative right now, and there isn't one sim single alternative that you would feel comfortable with. And I think to your point, Anna, and, and also Miles, um, what we really don't know yet, and we saw this with GDPR, is whether this all this being done in the name of privacy will be enforced. And by that, I mean, we knew that many companies were and continue to be in flaunting of GDPR rules, but we really haven't seen any major enforcement of GDPR yet. Certainly uh, very little with the large, with the big tech companies and almost none with the smaller ones. There've been a few examples here and there. So if we're doing all this in the name of privacy, but those privacy violations that are happening repeatedly of, of trading and alternative identifiers without consent, are not enforced, then there may be a section of the industry that just stays in denial and retreats to the unauthenticated open web. And, and they're fine with that. So there might be some portion of this industry that just tries to pretend that this isn't happening to them. 
Mm-hmm. That that sounds like not a very nice corner of the internet then to me because that seems like it's going to be like the the bottom feeder internet all over again, right? The penny CPMs. I, yes. I think we I think I think we have to be honest that there's there's a lot of that about anyway. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of cookie trading and 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 bogus IDs and fraud out there anyway. And if you begin to parse out the two halves of the internet a little more clearly, that might not be a bad thing. Hmm. The last thing I want to uh, touch on real quick um, before we run out of time is um, we've sort of been talking just there about, you know, the extent to which this will have privacy benefits. And it's been mentioned a bit already, but do you think that in a, in a cohort based world, the consumer really notices a difference and feels that they have more privacy protections on the web, regardless of like, you know, the extent to which that actually is true. Technically, do you think consumers will really notice the difference? Probably not. <laughs> I, I have a, an anecdote here for you. So I, uh, I was looking through my um, Google interest settings um, a while back. And much to my surprise, I discovered that I was interested in the Portuguese national football team. So, you know, like th- things like that uh, are, are very easy for uh, uh, a machine al- learning algorithm to create a connection, but to the actual consumer that seems ludicrous. And so, you know, you could have a case where the cohorts are actually working as intended and really well, but what that translates to practically is a really bizarre experience and there could be a really big gap between how uh, consumers perceive what they're interested in versus how it's actually interpreted on the other end. Yeah, I think people hate ads no matter what, <laughs> they just do. Uh, and the, 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 the thing that sort of, um, that I think the industry sort of needs to be careful with that it seems the cap- everybody wants to preserve this capability of a closed loop between measurement and targeting. And that's when people feel like they're being stalked. And so even if we do that at a cohort level, a lot of people's impressions of ads following them may be the same because they don't know that they're part of a cohort. Like, what do they care? Um, So I think I, I basically agree with Anna that from the consumer's perspective, I don't know that they're gonna see a tremendous amount of difference. Yeah. And, and I would just add that I think much of this is virtue signaling and brand positioning from companies. Mm. Um, when we see leading identity providers, third party identity providers say that they've always championed the value of first party data in their blog posts, yeah. you know, this is just bald faced um, appeal to our better natures. There is no technology company that will admit to invading your privacy or, or, or trading in your cookies without consent. But, you know, there's no, there, there are no innocents out there. So I think the perception from consumers will be largely set by the marketing budgets, which are considerable of, of the big tech players promoting the fact that they've taken these steps to be privacy preserving. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Miles, I would, I would kind of amend what you say about people hating ads uh, they're willing to understand the value exchange of receiving advertising for free content. Uh, but, and there maybe they're willing to tolerate ads. And if anybody said, would you rather have a targeted ad, which sounds kind of pernicious, this someone pointing a target at you or a personalized ad, well, personalized sounds so much nicer. I, but it, I, it, it makes for great TV ads that Google, that, that Apple has run talking about protecting your privacy. Yeah. I- we could talk for another hour about that, but I think that's this whole other question of uh, the value exchange. And Google, for one, has a tremendous amount of upside there. I'll give you an example. The other day, I'm in Portland, Oregon. I load up a map of my neighborhood. It's 5.15 p.m. I'm not seeing a bunch of click-to-order dinner options springing up right from local you know, restaurants in the map. Those would be ads. Those would not bother me. There's a clear value exchange there and I don't feel stalked. So it's like, there's a whole other world of digital advertising outside of this whole question of Chrome and and, and Flox and, and, you know, alternate identifiers. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut the conversation there because we are completely out of time. Um, So all there is left to say is thank you to Anna, Miles and Richard. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.